All right, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to the SF Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight is the Wednesday night well of being. Um, so I'm very honored to be here um, sharing the teaching, this medicine. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Tig. Just talking about names, so. Uh, I am um, a meditation teacher and I'm also a contemplative artist, so I do a lot of Dharma art. Um, on the meditation side of things, I teach um, on the secular side, I teach mindfulness-based stress reduction and the program that many of you are probably familiar with from Eve, uh, Cultivating Emotional Balance. I'm also a diaphragmatic breathing coach, uh, so we'll be doing some, a little bit of all of that tonight. Um, I teach in hospitals and universities, hence the secular aspect of it, but my personal practice is in Tibetan lineages. Uh, I lived in a monastery in the Himalayas for over a year um, that was in the Gelug uh, tradition. I'm also really influenced by Shambhala, especially with Shambhala arts, um, kind of merging creativity and meditation together. Um, so, um, welcome. Anyone new? New to the space? Anyone online? Welcome. Wonderful to have you with us. I see you raising your hands. Uh, so welcome to the Dharma Collective. This is a Sangha-led organization. Uh, so this is your center. This is your Dharma center. Um, I love this idea of interconnection and interdependence. There's not some kind of hierarchy here everyone is kind of contributing both from a practice standpoint teaching standpoint uh, but also in creating the space um, so we finally have this new space um, that the volunteers and i have been kind of putting together and beautifying so this is our space together um, and we're currently operating on a hybrid model so we have people in person and also online. Um, so very unique kind of um, container for us, both in the fact that it's Sangha led and that it's hybrid. Um, so a lot of really cool and unique aspects going on. Um, always opportunity for volunteering, for making donations. Um, and we're also looking for if anyone has any extra furniture, <laughs> I'll just give a little plug for that. We're looking for some comfy couches or chairs um, for our lounge. Um, so yeah, so tonight um, we're going to be continuing our exploration of emotion. So uh, a lot of the teachings over the past couple of weeks, uh, even though it's kind of grounded in this book on the path to uh, enlightenment, um, we've also been weaving together from different teachers uh, how we work with and meet our emotions, which is a founding pillar of the Dharma. Um, so obviously we've had Eve, um, and then we had Ryan Redman, who are both senior teachers of the CEB program. We had Venerable Tenzin teaching. So we've been kind of touching into concepts, emotions like fear and anger, some of the antidotes around uh, um, empathetic joy and the acronym RAIN, uh, kind of like a self-soothing, how to manage through emotions. Um, so we are going to continue that exploration. Um, we're going to talk particularly tonight on how we meet um, heightened emotional moments and how these practices of meditation can help us in the moment, but also how we can get ready ahead of time and kind of lay down some pathways in the mind and the brain that will help us uh, when we need it most. Um, so uh, it's also a full moon today. Uh, and so, you know, full moons pull on us, they pull on the, the water that's in us and water kind of represents emotional energy. It's not commenting on your shirt. <laughs> um, and so with the full moon, we can kind of sometimes feel heightened emotions. Uh, so it's a good time, always a good time to talk about um, how we navigate that. Um, in the Dharma or in the Buddhist traditions, the Full moon is a very auspicious time. Um, the calendar in Buddhism is a lunar calendar. Um, the celebrations are all based on the full and the new moon. Um, the Buddha attained enlightenment sitting under a full moon. Um, 
And it said that it's very auspicious to practice under a full moon, to set intentions under a full moon, and um, any merit that we accrue through good deeds or practice is said to be amplified 10, 10 million fold <laughs> under a full moon. So <laughs> today is a good day to practice. Um, so tonight I'm going to offer two practices um, and a short teaching in between. Um, so we're going to start with our first practice, which is really just to kind of help us arrive. We're going to do some breath work. Um, and if, if breath work is not comfortable for you, I will offer an alternative, which would be based on listening. Um, so you have agency in the practice. If, if breathing, deep breathing is not feeling good, we're all wearing masks. Uh, most of us are wearing masks in the room. Uh, so if that's not feeling good in a mask, then you, know, you can switch to sound or a, a more gentle type of breath. Um, and then from there, we'll transition into a mindfulness practice. Uh, I will offer an invitation for you to choose your anchor in this practice. So any sensory experience, it can be the breath, it can be sensations in the body, it could be sound. Um, so really you have agency again here to choose um, what you'd like to work with. Um, so with that, let's settle in for our first practice together. <clears throat> and as we make this transition, from the outer world into the inner world, just coming into a posture that feels comfortable and relaxed. It allows you to remain alert, awake, and knowing that you can practice sitting down on a chair, on the floor, you can lay down, you can stand up. Whatever your chosen posture for this practice is, just taking a moment to notice what's here as we begin to shift from that outer world to the inner world. And first letting the awareness drop out of the thinking mind and down into the feeling body. Noticing where the attention went with that invitation to come down into the body. Noticing the energy that's here, perhaps a specific sensation is coming forward. And there's no should or shouldn't, just being with what's here right now, body. Maybe there's some leftover energy from a busy day. Maybe the body is tired or sore. No need to fix or change anything, just noticing the way it is in the body right now. And then let's take a moment to shift into the mind stream. So what are your thoughts like? the quality of your awareness. Again, maybe there's lingering energy in the mind from conversations or activities today. Maybe there's some repeating thought that you haven't been able to let go of. Taking a moment to be with the, the mind as the observer. And then finally, let's come to the heart, the seat of emotions. What's the emotional landscape right now? What's the mood? What are the feelings? And as the poet Rumi invites us to welcome whatever visitor is showing up in our guest house of the heart. Maybe it's sadness, maybe fear, perhaps joy. Maybe it's a combination of different emotions that are here. Whatever it is that you're experiencing, it's welcome here. 
no need to change or push anything away. Let's take a moment now to return to the body and just check the posture, finding uh, upright back, the spine, the neck and the head all aligned. Bringing that vividness into the attention through this upright posture, if you're seated or standing, if you're laying down, just making sure there's that alignment between the head, the neck and the back. And then balancing that upright posture with a sense of ease. So inviting a quality of relaxation into the practice by checking the muscles of the face, softening if there's any tension or tightness. Softening the muscles around the eyes, relaxing the jaw. Checking that the shoulders are soft, the abdomen is soft, the pelvic floor is soft. And anywhere that there might still be tension or tightness, perhaps just allowing it to be there, softening the mind around it. Before we move into the main part of this practice, perhaps taking a moment here to set an intention for the time together tonight an attitude or a way of being, perhaps to be relaxed, to be curious, maybe to bring a beginner's mind. And from here we'll shift into just a bit of breath work. So either coming to an awareness of the breath, just as it is without manipulating or changing it, and that the breath isn't available, perhaps shifting your awareness to the sound in your environment. And just letting the awareness mix completely with either the breath or the sound. This is a way of anchoring ourselves into the present moment through the sensory objects. And if you are with sound, just resting the awareness with the rise and fall, allowing the vibration of whatever is causing the sound to arise in the eardrum. And if you're with the breath and you'd like to join me for some deeper breathing practice, on the next inhale, invite a sense of expansion through the belly, through the abdomen. And as you breathe out, a sense of ease and relaxation. So every in-breath, a sense almost like you could push the abdomen towards the wall opposite you really stretching the abdomen from the inside of the body out as you breathe in. And then releasing and relaxing as you breathe out. And some people find it supportive to put one or both hands on the upper part of their abdomen to really engage with this type of breath. So as you breathe in, extending the abdomen almost as if you could push the hand away from the body. And then as you exhale, allowing it to softly drop back down. And if you're resting with sound, perhaps noticing the mixing of my voice with the sounds of your environment. The steady sound mixed with the sounds that arise and then disappear. And 
And if you're with the diaphragmatic breathing, just continuing the sense of expansion on the inhale, almost as if you could fill a balloon in the belly as you breathe in. And then that balloon deflates as you breathe out. You are with the breath, just an invitation for a couple more cycles of really finding your edge. What is it like to expand in the lower part of the torso, maybe even down into the pelvic floor as you breathe in? Noticing that sense of softening and letting go that's released, that's required on the inhale to allow the body to expand. Perhaps noticing this might feel uncomfortable. I feel vulnerable to allow the belly to extend forward, just being with that. And whether you're with the breath or sound, noticing how the mind may be moving, slipping away into thoughts or other sensory experiences and remembering that that's part of the practice. We need the wandering mind in order to practice returning back to the present moment again and again. So in this way, a wandering mind is never a problem. And then if you are with the diaphragmatic breathing to the next couple breaths, see what it's like to expand on the inhale, first in the abdomen and then up into the chest now. Really taking that full breath from bottom to top. And then exhaling from top to bottom. And if you have been practicing that diaphragmatic breath, releasing that now on the next exhale and returning to a natural breathing rhythm. And then as we begin to transition into a period of silent practice, choosing your anchor, maybe staying with the breath, maybe staying with sound. Maybe it's other sensations in the body. Perhaps it's being the observer of the thought once again. But choosing with a sense of conviction and ardent determination to stay with whatever this sense that you've chosen to be with for the next 10 minutes or so. Letting the mind rest gently with whatever that sense is. Remembering that any time you notice the awareness has slipped away, you're already back in the present moment just by noticing that that happened and you can choose to come back to this moment. Practicing for if in this way for the next 10 minutes.
I'm taking a moment to check in with the awareness, gathering up any wandering aspects of mind and gently going back to the sense that you chose. Remembering that we're not forcing the attention to stay with that sense. It's simply an island to return to. We're not trying to stop thoughts or anything really. Just noticing, being with each moment of this practice, however it is unfolding for you, whether the mind is busy or calm, no goal or objective, there's no right or wrong. Whatever you do notice that the mind has slipped away, perhaps calling forward that intention that you set earlier and meet that moment of mind wandering with that same attitude, whether it's relaxed, curious, beginner's mind, and then returning to that sensory object with that same attitude. It's an easy returning again and again. Remembering whatever we're noticing outside of that sensory experience is only a distraction if we label it as bad or wrong or shouldn't be happening. Otherwise, it's just simply something that's happening in the present moment.
And now releasing the object of your practice. Just taking a moment to notice what's here now. Any shifts that happened in the past 15 minutes, whether that's in the body, the mind stream, or the heart. Taking that internal weather report of what's here now. So taking some time to transition out of that practice, making any stretches or movements that would feel comfortable. <clears throat> but before we move into the teachings tonight, I just want to open it up if there's any questions about that practice or anything that you'd like to share that came up for you. There were kind of two parts to that. There was the breath work slash listening to sound and then there was the mindfulness sitting what did you notice what came up for you mm -hmm. mm. yeah how did you respond to the tightness? And tell me your name. Alex. So for those on Zoom, Alex was just sharing that he felt a sense of tightness in the abdomen. Yeah. Yeah. All, all through his torso. Um, so tightness as he was doing the diaphragmatic breathing, but also and also a sense of heat, generating some heat. And he was sharing that um, his response to that um, was to just keep, kind of keep going, going with it, working with it. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's very interesting because for those of us that were practicing that that deep diaphragmatic breath, it's almost like we're stretching the body out from the inside. And a lot of us, for one reason or another, we're very used to squeezing and pulling in our bellies. <laughs> and so this invitation to kind of let it out can sometimes bring up some stuff and it can also feel tight. Um, I like to think of the diaphragmatic breath as almost like breathing boot camp. The diaphragm is a muscle. Uh, and it, so we can train it. Um, it's the only muscle in the body that when it contracts, it flattens. So it's that the tightness that we experience when we're trying to push out on the in-breath is actually the contraction of the diaphragm. Um, so that's kind of how you know it's working when you feel, feel that way. So over time, you know, we can't walk around all the time often. We can't walk around all the time, you know, sticking our belly out and trying, like when we're having conversations, sometimes it's hard to remember how to breathe that way. That's why the practice is so supportive because it strengthens the muscle. So when we're not in the practice, our body has some muscle memory there of how to breathe in that expansive way. Um, and I love what you were sharing too about you just kept going, you know, listen, listen to, um, should I keep doing this or should I move on? You know, and I think that that's really skillful. Um, and with the diaphragmatic breathing in particular, which we're going to talk about tonight in, in relation to emotions, the diaphragmatic breathing is one of the best ways to engage the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that runs through the body that signals fight or flight. So when we are feeling an emotional trigger and we switch into that deep breathing, we actually can help relax and calm the nervous system. So it kind of creates a bit more of a spacious view when we are feeling that trigger which we're going to talk about a lot 
in the next. Thank you. Teague, if I might read from the chat, um, Denise said thank sure. you. And um, one of our participants, one of our Sangha, dear Sangha members, um, identified his iPad, says, Teague, the way you teach allows me to open my heart to abundant love. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. I got chills hearing that. <laughs> it's Annette. Uh, thank you, Annette. Annette, night iPad. <laughs> Um, Aaron, your page, did you want to? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think I was really confused with the internet. I didn't have the right understanding of the from on the computer. Mm -hmm. It was really nice to have that experience with the other as opposed to the last one. And then you were going to see another thing. I could, you know, sort of let go of it. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Natural intelligence of the body. Um, so Cage was just sharing that um, so she's our volunteer for the night and is kind of operating the technology. And so during that practice, she was feeling some tightness or restriction and you were pointing to your throat and your chest. Yeah. yeah um just around kind of maintaining what's happening with the technology but that as she continued breathing she noticed it started softening and relaxing and one thing that i want to point out with that is you were still monitoring the technology and so that's that's the beautiful thing about the diaphragmatic breathing it doesn't take the stress away obviously it just shifts our relationship to it so um you know we're going to talk a little bit about the emotional triggers those triggers don't go away just because we're diaphragmatic breathing, right? But if we engage in the breath that way, or we've already been practicing, then we actually have that spaciousness to continue on whatever, continue working with whatever it is that's causing the stress or the tightness, um, but in a way that is more skillful. So thank you for sharing that. We have um, one more person in the chat. Colette, mm -hmm. and she writes, I felt joy at the end of the sit. This has never happened to me before. Wonderful. Thank you, Colette. Uh, would you be up for sharing a little bit about that joy that you were experiencing? Was it something that was in the body and the mind? It was both. It was in the body and the mind. And it was just a very beautiful feeling. So mm. thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for sharing that with us. <clears throat> okay, so if any questions come up at any point during the rest of our time together, please feel free to ask. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can put it in the chat um, and Diane, who's monitoring the room, will um, read it out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about emotions. <laughs> um, so Diane, if you, um, Diane's gonna share uh, on her screen, hopefully we'll all be able to see it. Um, so this is a slide that comes from the Co uh, Cultivating Emotional Balance course that many of you have probably seen this slide before or heard um, about how an emotional, uh, an emotion can unfold. Um, and so I'm not really going to give a teaching on the full timeline, but I think it is helpful just to frame where we're going to go tonight and the next practice that we're going to do um, with this timeline. So we have um, five steps. Uh, you know, we know that emotions happen in a split second. We, we all know that that to be true. Um, what this graphic does is help us really slow it down so we can kind of see uh, how things are unfolding. And also how these tools of the Dharma, how the tools of awareness through mindfulness and, and the compassion of an open heart can apply to each part of uh, an emotional timeline. So we start with, um, I like to actually start with the event. So something happens, someone cuts us off in traffic. Um, and the precondition, so the event is at the top uh, under step two. And then the precondition is step one, the left white circle. So someone cuts us off on traffic, that's the event. 
the precondition is what's going on. I'm late for, I'm late to meet someone, or I didn't sleep well the night before, or I skipped lunch and I'm hungry, kind of like what's setting the stage for this emotion to come up. And then we have the perception database, which is that gray circle down at the bottom of step two. And so that um, perception database is what is it in our personal history that has happened before um, that could be causing a heightened emotional reaction. So perhaps, you know, growing up, it was like reinforced that we always had to be on time. Um, or perhaps um, someone had a conversation with you in the past about feeling disrespected about, you know, you being late or something like that. And so all three of these, the event, the precondition, and then what's in our database come together to create the trigger, uh, panic or anger or whatever it may be that uh, arises when the person cuts us off in traffic, we haven't eaten lunch, and we have this history of being late. So all three, I kind of, I like to call it like the perfect storm. <laughs> all three come together and boom, that makes the trigger. As soon as we're triggered, we enter into a state. So both uh, physiological and psychological. So you can see here in step three, we start responding to that trigger. Um, usually first we'll notice the physical changes, the heart starts beating fast. We might notice, depending on what emotion it is, we might notice energy in our biceps or our legs. Um, and then also we have the psychological shift. So what's happening in the mind? Um, we're getting stuck, we're starting to spiral, uh, we're starting to fixate or um, get really tight in the mind around what's happening. Um, this is also the point you can kind of see uh, there's a gray shaded box from here at, at this point. This is called the selective filtering period. And so once the trigger happens and we're moving into this part of the emotional timeline, we're not seeing clearly, right? We're being clouded. Uh, or I like to say the lens is a little bit cracked um, because we're being overtaken by this response, the release of stress hormones or the cycling and spiraling of thoughts. We're no longer truly with what's happening. Um, we've kind of left and gone somewhere else. Um, it's a really important aspect of working with our emotions, even just the mantra of saying, I'm not seeing clearly right now, can lead to, I need to take a break, or communicating with someone, like, what's going on for you. So once we have that state, then we shift into what happens, how do we take action from there? And so we have the constructive action and then the destructive action. So I'm triggered, my heart is racing. I am, I'm having racing thoughts. And so there, it's very easy to slip into destructive action. I could, you know, yell, scream, flip off the person that cut us off in traffic, maybe not the most skillful things. Uh, in this example of, you know, running late, someone cuts us off, we could get all flustered and then we get to the meeting and we're just, our mind is everywhere. So we don't really have that skillful, wide, spacious awareness to engage with the meeting. And then constructive action obviously would be the skillful means, which we're going to talk about uh, in a minute. So like understanding like this person, you know, was just not paying attention. It's not personal. We'll get to the meeting when we do and it will be okay. Maybe even offering that person that cut us off some loving kindness or compassion may you get to where you're going safely and on time. And then at the end of the timeline, as we come out of this selective um, filtering period, it ends with the post condition. Uh, and so kind of in retrospect, the reflection, the learning, what happened, um, what can I learn from this experience, which is really cool because the post condition then inform it becomes the precondition for the next time that that uh, emotion arises. So that was a very quick <laughs> crash course on the emotional episode timeline. Um, uh, I guess we'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions or anything coming up for anyone. I mean, it can happen in, you know, a half a second. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's different. It's different for everyone. You know, it can last, you know, we can, we can, the physiological changes can stay with us for a little while, you know, 
Um, so I think it's different um, depending on, on uh, our pre and post conditions. The other thing that we talk a lot about in the course is that um, we can have multiple triggers going on. Uh, so like the physiological response to the trigger might actually become an event for a new emotional timeline. And the, all these are unfolding at the same time or our trigger and our reaction might trigger someone else. So then you get multiple timelines going on at the same time. So this is a very just simplified way of, the, of understanding how the emotion unfolds. Okay. Um, so, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just putting in chat, that this was the perfect lesson for what happened to me not too long ago today. Um, and I didn't get cut off in traffic, but I, I fell down and I kind of hurt myself, but um, it was a very uh, psychologically and emotional experience because I am, I'm older and I don't walk very well. So falling is a big, um, you know, it's a scary event because I start thinking about what could have happened and, you know, future um, injury. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is a perfect example of what I went through and what I'm seeing. I'm in the post condition now. Um, and the post condition, as you said, is the precondition for the next time, because um, I expect I don't think this will be the last time that I'll stumble and fall, you mm -hmm. know, because that's, it's, it's just part, it seems to, even though I'm careful and mindful, things happen. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. I have, to, you know, you have to deal with it, you know, when it happens. And I thank you for sharing that. Is this Roseanne? Yes. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad that you're okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that last part that you shared, I love because there's this combination, uh, you know, like things happen and, and then it's okay. You know, like the, the com perfect combination of mindfulness and compassion, you know, like I'm aware that this might happen again and it'll, you know, <clears throat> I'll be able to work with it. Thank you for illustrating that. I wanted to ask if you feel comfortable sharing when you were in that trigger, what were the physiological or psychological changes that you noticed? Well, when I first fell, there's a, there's kind of a moment of um, shock, you know, surprise, because you don't know, you know, you don't expect it. It's just unexpected. You can't keep your balance and you fall. So there's this sort of shock that it happened. And then, um, you know, you're kind of checking yourself to make sure you to, to, to determine the extent of any possible injury <laughs> and then somebody helped me get up which was kind it was very nice um but um you know so i don't know there was a physiological sort of sense of panic in a way and mm -hmm. fear and um surprise and shock and a whole bunch of different things like that mm -hmm. um and psychologically, like I said, it just triggers a lot of um, fear about um, about injuring myself and what that would mean in terms of my ability to, to function, you know, everyday functioning, which is getting more and more challenging as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing your experience with that. Um, so the uh psychological state that you're in it sounds like aside from the physical shock and making sure that you're okay from a mind perspective that kind of like tightening that tightening around what was happening in the mind um the kind of spiraling of thoughts and um that's all part of that selective filtering period um and so one of the practices that we're going to do next 
is going to be a way of kind of training the mind to open up a little bit more spacious. So yes, there's shock and yes, there is this, oh, I hope I'm okay. And all this, all the thoughts that come with it, but also there's a part of the body. There's the parts of the body that are okay. There's the person that helped you and showed you kindness and compassion. Like there's all these other things that are happening at the same time when we're able to kind of hold a broader perspective. Yes, there is the discomfort and the tightness, but there's also other things that are happening that can be um, a kind of like an invitation to zoom out a bit and see that. Yeah. And then with the physio the physical changes, there's, you know, that that shock that and the nervous system kind of responds in that way. Um, and that's this is a really good example of where things like the diaphragmatic breath can come in and help calm the nervous system and see like, okay, I'm okay. You know, I can I can deal with this, I can receive this person's help. Um, so that breath work is one of the primary tools for me in my personal practice when I'm noticing like for me, my heart starts going and I start feeling the energy in my arms. So I know when I feel that and people in my life can always tell what I'm triggered because my hand goes onto my abdomen <laughs> because then it's just my way of calming my nervous system. Um, and then uh, I kind of like, I call it a 911, like an emergency practice, the deep breathing. Um, and then the practice that we're gonna explore next is kind of a training for the psychological aspect of it. So our mind doesn't get so tightly fixated on what's wrong, what's happening. We allow it to be there. We're not trying to push it away, um, but we have a bigger, uh, a wider um, lens that we can view what's happening too. So Rosanne, yeah. again, I'm glad you're okay. And, and thank you for sharing and, and helping us um, explore this a little bit more. Well, I'd just like to say one more thing about it, sure. and that is that there's a time factor. You know, there's the initial event, and then, you know, think, um, I think the nervous system, calming the nervous system is a really important aspect to um, a little trauma like this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it could have been a lot worse, but, um, you know, the my nervous system takes a while to calm down and i'm still in the process of calming down <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah but it takes a while to settle to settle down and you're for your thoughts to settle down and yep. you know so it's not something that happened you know even if you're mindful and you're breathing and whatever you're doing to help yourself you have to ex i mean i think for me there's a question of a certain amount of giving yourself time you mm -hmm. know to um to settle down again yep yep absolutely and um one of the things that we'll talk about after this next practice is this this practice um can actually help the recovery faster you know so it still may take time um but the more that we can train our mind to meet those moments of stress or heightened emotion uh, we be we're we're practicing mindfulness and self compassion. We're nurturing ourselves. We're taking care of ourselves. Um, but when we start doing some practices to train the mind to stay spacious during stress, we can recover faster, um, potentially physically, but also psychologically. <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, I'd like to kind of introduce our next practice. Um, Paige, are there more? Can you see if there's more? Oh. Okay. Um, so this is a practice that I like to call holding both, um, or I also like to call it making room. And so what we do is we are exploring dichotomies of experiences. So two different sensations in the body what is it like to be with both of them at the same time? Gratitude and discomfort. How, what is it like to be with those at the same time? And so the idea behind this practice is that it's a mind training. It's not necessarily something that we try and do in the moment of a trigger or heightened stress. You can, you can try, uh, but it's more about like a preemptive training of the mind to stay spacious. So when we look at that emotional episode timeline and there is the psychological state, the psychological response, we fixate and we get tight on what's wrong. That's all we can focus on. And so if we start training the mind now 
So be able to hold these dichotomies. Yes, there's pain. Yes, I am uh, having these looping thoughts and there's someone here helping me or I can take care of myself. Like there's a way out of the situation rather than getting so tightly caught in, into the spiral. Um, and so uh, we're not trying to bypass or get rid of anything by holding both. We're not trying to say, these are the ways that I'm suffering and then like find a scale of gratitude that will help balance it out. That's not what this is. It's about opening up space. So when the difficulty happens, we're not so tightly bound by it. Um, some of you have heard me use this analogy when I'm teaching particularly about the heart opening practices of uh, this analogy around a cup of salt. So if we take a cup of salt and we put it in a cup of water and we try and drink it, it's gonna be pretty disgusting. We're not really gonna be able to get it in. If we take that same cup of salt and we put it in a gallon bucket and we try and drink that water, it'll probably be very strong and not taste very pleasant, but we'll be able to drink it. Same cup of salt in maybe a five gallon bucket, you might not even notice it and you can drink it. So the analogy here is that that trigger or that stress or that discomfort, it's the same in all of those examples. We didn't get rid of the salt. We didn't take any salt out. We actually just kind of opened up more space so it was tolerable to take it in. And so the loving kindness, the compassion, gratitude, joy, these are all, that's the water. You know, those are the things that are helping us keep that spacious mind. So in this practice in particular, it's helping create these pathways so that when that difficulty does happen, we can see it with a much more spacious perspective rather than getting so tightly fixated on it. So what we're going to do is um, explore holding both. How do we hold two different things that are happening at the same time so we don't get totally consumed by one of them? Um, we'll start by exploring some different parts of the body, some different sensations in the body, and then there'll be an invitation to come into the mind, use our cognition to think about things that might be difficult at the same time that things that are good, things that feel good or are pleasant. Um, so again, remember that this is really a mind training. Uh, I always love to think of meditation as kind of the mind gym or strengthening the pathways um, to be present and to meet stress with uh, skillful means. Um, so bringing in a sense of curiosity, being open if this is the first time that you practice this. We'll use mindfulness as a tool here. So if you notice the mind starts slipping away into sounds outside or in your environment, uh, the to-do list pops up or any of the analysis of something that happened earlier today comes up in this practice, we use mindfulness as a tool just to return back to where we are, okay? So this will be um, about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less. So starting to transition into a comfortable posture once again. <clears throat> And perhaps you'd like to close your eyes or just lower them down to a surface in front of you to a soft gaze. And just to help bring us into the practice, we'll take a moment to arrive back into the inner world. <clears throat> And as we shift our awareness, perhaps coming back into the body. Perhaps feeling the points of contact of the ground beneath you. Knowing that you're supported and you're held. And then coming up into the spine and just double checking the posture, if you're seated or standing, perhaps a sense of a slight lifting through each of the vertebra. If you're laying down, just checking that the back is straight in alignment with the head and the neck. And it's this dignified posture that allows us to bring a sense of vividness into this practice. So it's later in the day for many of us. And finding this dignified posture can help bring a sense of wakefulness.
And then returning to that sense of ease through the body, softening the muscles of the face once again, the jaw, the shoulders, the abdomen. And so to start this exploration, let's find a place in the body that we might be feeling a sense of pressure or hardness, maybe where we're noticing that contact of the body against a chair or the floor. Maybe it's the back resting on the chair or the bottom on the cushion, feet on the floor. Finding a place in the body where it's, there's this sense of hardness or pressure, firmness. It could be the weight of the body. It could be the feeling of gravity holding us down. Just bringing the awareness to this area, being curious, not trying to change trying to manipulate anything, just exploring what the sensation feels like. Maybe there's a sense of texture, maybe there's a temperature or a color associated with this sensation. Letting the mind rest for another moment here. And now let's shift to an area of the body where you're experiencing softness. Maybe it's the soft touch of fabric against the skin. Maybe it's a feeling of air against the skin. Maybe it's the softness of the belly as you're breathing in and out. Just finding an area of the body where you can experience a sensation of softness. Again, exploring what the sensation is like. Letting the mind mix completely with the felt experience of softness, the color, texture, temperature to it. Now an invitation to return to that sensation of hardness and at the same time know that that sensation of softness is also here. And so for the next few moments, just play with this. See how the mind holds both of these experiences happening right now. You might notice the awareness moving back and forth between the two from one to the other. You might notice moments where you're able to zoom out and be with both of these sensations simultaneously. Remembering there's no right or wrong here. We're just exploring. So however the mind may be engaging with this practice, allow it. Notice the mind moving back and forth between the hard and the soft. Or perhaps noticing what it's like to be with both simultaneously. How does that feel?
We're not trying to get rid of anything. We're not trying to balance out the feelings. We're just exploring what it's like to be with both. Remembering if the mind slips away from these hard and soft sensations and thoughts or other senses, you just gently invite it back to these two areas that we're exploring. No problem. Grateful for the opportunity to practice. And now letting go of those two sensations in the body. And for a moment, let's gather up all of our attention into the right hand. Noticing sensations here, perhaps of contact the hand is making with another part of the body or fabric or surface. Maybe it's a sensation of temperature or moisture on the skin of the hand. Perhaps feeling the right hand from the inside, noticing sensations of tingling or pulsing. And then let's shift over to the left hand. So letting go of the right hand for a moment and bring all the awareness into the left hand whether it's contact, sensations on the surface of the skin of the left hand, or perhaps sensations inside the left hand. And now let's Take a moment to practice being with both the right and the left hand at the same time. You may notice the mind titrating back and forth between the two. You may notice times where you're able to be with both of the sensations, both of the hands. And just resting for another moment here, experiencing the right and the left at the same time. And now letting go of an awareness of the hands and we'll shift into an invitation here to come back up into cognition and call to mind something that's happening in your life today or right now that feels really good. It can be a big thing, a small thing, an energetic thing, a material thing. Calling to mind something that feels good in your life right now. If things are really tough and that invitation is hard to find, perhaps just being here with community, practicing. Perhaps noticing a sense of appreciation or gratitude as you reflect on this good thing. And as we hold this aspect in our mind's eye, notice if any sensation arises in the body that's associated with that appreciation or gratitude, maybe a, a warmth or a softness in the heart, maybe a relaxing of a certain part of the body.
And now for a moment, let's shift from that good thing to calling to mind something that's happening either now or today that's difficult. Maybe not the hardest thing, but something that allows you to feel a sense of discomfort or an awareness of something that is difficult. <clears throat> And as you either visualize or replay this event or tap into this energy of unpleasantness, notice how that feels in the body. I mean, there's a tightness or a constriction somewhere. Noticing how the body might be responding to this thought of discomfort. Notice how the mind is responding, trying to figure out how to change it or fix it. Just calling forward the courage to be with it for one more moment. And now here's the practice. Can we be with both? What is it like to know that this one good thing is happening at the same time as this one unpleasant thing? And just notice how this is unfolding for you. Maybe the mind is moving back and forth between the pleasant and the unpleasant. Maybe something else is happening where you're able to zoom out and be with both of these things at the same time. No expectation or right or wrong way of doing this. Just taking a moment to be with both. And then letting go of any thought forms or visualization before we come to an end of this practice together let's take one deep breath in following the air into the body and then as we exhale and release that air letting go of this practice take some time to transition back to open eyes as you have them closed I'm curious, what was that like? What did you notice? Uh, you were going back and forth between them, yeah. or yeah. In a way that I didn't used to it back then. Uh huh. Or I showed the point of contact by posting the floor here, and then I had it nailed the fabric in that shirt. Mm -hmm. And I could just feel those. Mm. Um, so what's being shared is that he's able to um, access the feelings of the hardness and the softness in the body at the same time, but when he was practicing with the um, difficulty and the pleasantness in the mind stream, it was a little bit more of this kind of going back and forth between the two. And I think that that's, that's very, well, every, anything that's happening in your experience is normal. <laughs> this is remembering that this is a training So some people uh, I, th I actually taught this this morning and someone couldn't do it with their hands, but they could do it with their emotions, you know, so it's different for for all of us in different times. 
um, but just being curious. So how did how did you respond when you were moving back and forth between the mental formations of pleasant and unpleasant? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he's saying that his mind drifted more. Um, were you able to feel any sensation in the body that arise that was arising as you held those formations? Mm -hmm. And that's a really so he's saying that kind of lost touch with his body, and I think that's a key point here. So when we talk about the emotional episode timeline, there is the physical response, and so uh, it's important almost to be able to feel into what's happening in the body ahead before the trigger continues unfolding that way, um, but. As much as we don't want to feel things that that are unpleasant, <laughs> this is a, a really good practice in being with that because the more that we can feel it, then we can work with it. Um, but again, the moving back and forth between the two, whether it's the hands or the hard and the soft or the uh, gratitude and the challenge, that's all part of the practice. Uh, thank you for sharing. Some chat showed up. Was there anything in the chat, Diane? Um, I um, invited folks to just unmute and chime in, or if it's more comfortable for folks um, online to raise their virtual hand and I can bring them to your attention. C Alexis and Cindy uh, chatted, thank you very much, exclamation point, namaste to all. Thank you. So what else did y'all notice? <laughs> and remind me of your name Malena. Malena so Malena was sharing that she noticed even though her eyes were closed um, when um, we were exploring the sensations in the hand that she noticed that her eyes were moving from um, the right to the left and that's all part of this you know it's all part of the being with these sensations that sometimes we ping pong between them whether it's with our awareness our eyes our feelings, our thoughts, um, but it's all being held in this container of practice. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? How about the when you're working with that, that pleasant feeling and unpleasant feeling? What did you notice with the invitation to be with both of those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so different experiencing the pleasant and unpleasant thoughts or events in different parts of the body. So what was it like when you moved into the phase of practice of being with both of them? So it sounds like it was a little bit of back and forth and both at the same time. Yeah. That's also a big part of this practice is that we will notice there's kind of the titrating and then all of a sudden it might just stop and you're with both. You know, I noticed in that particular practice when I was practicing with y'all, everything just kind of seemed to neutralize. Even though that's not necessarily the goal, I actually kept like, wait, what was the what was the positive thing? And what was it? It just all kind of flattened and my mind got really quiet. 
Um, not to say that that is something that we strive for in the practice, it's just what I was noticing in that moment. So what we're doing here is really preemptively training the mind that when we move into that emotional trigger that we instead of specifically when we get into the psychological state um, that we start fixating on what's wrong or we start fixating on the um, like the tightness, the spiraling, the looping thoughts um, that we get kind of lost in it and our focus becomes like so narrow on what is wrong that we're missing everything else that's that's good or that's neutral around us and we just become so tight it's almost like blinders you know with the blinders on and all we can see is what's wrong and so again this isn't really about trying to negate that or trying to bypass it by practicing being with both it's just trying to open up spaciousness in the mind so that when that trigger does happen we don't get so lost in it Again, it's like the salt and the water analogy. Practicing being with dichotomies of experience is like the water. It creates more space, creates more fluidity, it creates more room for choice or room for us to work with what's happening. So I really like to think of this practice as kind of like a preemptive, a preemptive practice or that we're creating the neural pathways in the brain so that when stress or trigger or something uncomfortable does happen, that we don't get so completely caught in it, that it gives us a little bit of room to work with it and shift into that uh, constructive action rather than the destructive. Um, and that looks different for all of us. It could be taking a break in a conversation, it could be going for a walk, taking a nap, a shower, you know, taking care of ourselves, however we need. The holding both practice is something that almost gives us like a bit of a head start. Um, but as I said in the beginning, this is a really hard practice to do in the moment of a trigger. You know, like try, when, when someone, you're in an argument with someone and you're like, oh, it's sunny out, you know, <laughs> like, let me, let me focus on that. I mean, that might be helpful for some people uh, and it has helped me in the past, but the primary objective of this practice or the primary intention of this practice is really to prime the mind, to prep the mind so that when that argument does happen, again, we, we don't get completely lost in it. So T, just a couple of people in the chats wrote, um, Denise wrote, thank you. And then she wrote, they melted together at one point and there was a gentleness and ease. And the person who was calling, uh, labeling themselves as iPad this evening, wrote, I noticed to be careful what I focus on because I have a lot of power to influence my well being." Mm. And someone raised their hand, I can't tell who it is from here. Oh, me that's just... me. Um, I just have a question. This is so incredible, first of all. Um, but do you see this helping or being preemptive for for some of the bigger things that happen in life? Um, for, you know, a loved one passes away or, or the, the big, the kind of big stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you see this working for preemptively helping in those moments. I know that there's really nothing that can prepare us for that, but um, would this be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that you're emphasizing preemptive there. Cause I think, you know, when we experience the loss of a loved one or any like uh, trauma or things like that, this is a practice in, in the moment, as I said, is going to be really difficult. So preemptively, yes. Um, like I said, it's kind of like priming, priming the mind to meet those moments. Uh, I have another thought that just lost it. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely, you know, I think again, it's like that training, getting ready. Um, so and there, you know, and that's that specific example when something big does happen, if we have been practicing this, maybe perhaps we would simultaneously be feeling the loss and the grief at the same time that we would be able to grateful, be grateful that we even knew that person or that we had time with them, you know, so instead of getting completely, again, the wave, <laughs> getting knocked down by the wave of grief, there's also some glimmers. I, I want to just keep emphasizing this. It's not about balance. So we're not trying to find something when something really hard happens. We're not trying to find something equally good to try and negate that. That's not what this is, but it might help us when big things happen 
that uh, that we have that we still have that sense of spaciousness so we don't get lost in what's going on. Thank, Thank you for that question. Yeah. Did anyone really struggle with it? Was it really difficult or frustrating or challenging? A little challenging for me is um, I noticed the cognitive activation. I just kind of coming back to where there's this important thing is that I felt like I wanted to review. So it was interesting to kind of be like, oh, there, oh, yeah, I'm doing that. And I was like, oh, wait. Wait, I'm saying things in my hand. <laughs> and then my cognitive act, my, the cognition would come in, and then it was like, it was just so present that it was also like, oh, the hand feels, but then it started being like narrating the hand, and then I was like, started to have a trouble feeling the hand, and then I was like, oh, I'm, telling, I'm telling myself what feeling the hand feels like, and then I was like, no, no, what does the hand feel like? What does it actually feel like? Not the, mm -hmm. just not not writing an essay. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was interesting to kind of see that go on. Mm. Basically, it was harder. It was harder to be present. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Could you all online hear that? No. Okay. Um, so. Um, Pamela was describing, particularly with the hands, that she was noticing the mind would wander, the mind would go into analysis or thinking about the hand uh, and, have, and catching that narrative that was unfolding about the hand and then shifting back into the sensation of the hand. Um, and I think that this is a really powerful demonstration of why mindfulness is so important as a stabilizing, or I should say as a tool, for when we're practicing other meditations, um, that the mindfulness of what's happening in the mind stream while we're practicing loving kindness or compassion, like the mind still wanders. Just because we're practicing something that's not called mindfulness doesn't mean that all of a sudden the mind is super focused and steady. Um, and so what I think um, Pamela's experience is showing us is that that practice of catching the mind wandering and then, oh, Oh, okay. I'm not. I'm. I. Oh, let me come back to the hand, rather than I'm doing this wrong or I'm bad at this. It just really demonstrates why, in all of these lineages of Dharma, we focus so much on mind stabilization, so that we can notice when we are doing different, uh, different types of practices. Um, we can notice whatever's happening in the mind stream. It's not wrong, it's not bad, it's just what's happening. And then we can come back to whatever it is that we're practicing. Um, for any of you that have been on a Vipassana retreat, you know, we practice single point of concentration. Maybe I'll be giving this away a little bit, but you know, on a 10 day retreat, you're practicing single point of concentration with the breath and the body for eight or nine days. And then at the very, the last day, you're practicing loving kindness. That's how important it is to practice stabilizing the mind before we move on to any other type of practice. And I'll just bring it home with this, you know, it's the two wings of the bird. Many of you have probably heard this analogy about the Dharma, that there's wisdom, the wisdom of clear seeing and insight that comes from practicing mindfulness combined with the uh, open heart, um, the skillful means that comes from an open um, and relaxed heart. And it's the two wings of the bird. If we're really skilled at mindfulness and not really having too much of an open heart, we'll just go in one circle. If we have an open heart, but we don't have a steady mind, we'll go in the other way. So really finding balance between those two. And we can find it in practices like this. It's something as simple as coming into our big toe. We can help develop that, that wisdom, that insight, that steady mind. So we're Maddie, almost at... If you have time, Maddie raised your hand. Yeah, but sure, if we don't have time, if we don't have time, it's not critical. It's, it's okay. It's fine. Go ahead. I guess it had to do with um, the progression of soft and hard, and then um, left hand, right hand, and then going into good and bad. And what I really loved about left hand, right hand is with soft and hard, I noticed soft is good, hard is bad. But when it came mm. to left hand, right hand, I was with it because I loved that they were both very neutral to me. This is left hand, 
And there's just right, there was no value judgment on it. And it was this perfect stepping stone, you know, back to good and bad that I didn't feel myself resisting as much or clinging as much because sort of the left-hand, right-hand neutrality just grounded me that there's two things happening or a zillion things happening. But of course, in this particular case, there was two. But I also just really love that at any given time, you can actually hold. I mean, I, before we did it, I thought it would be impossible to hold two things in my head at the same time. But somehow as we progressed, it became really easy. So I just wanted to appreciate you know, those particular things you pick before you got to good and bad, which has an inherent value judgment, inherent pushing and pulling away. So it was really nice that you grounded it with things that were a little bit more neutral. And I really appreciated this experience. It was pretty unique. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, there are a couple, as you were talking, there are a couple of thumbs up that popped up on the screen and people in the room are all nodding their head. So it seems like that seems to be uh, uh, a common experience for us here. And I, I think too, like what's so interesting about the way that you were describing that, and we heard, we've heard these words a couple of times, people sharing a positive and negative, good and bad. And not, you know, we could do a whole 10 day retreat on the negative and the positive aspects, because in, when we talk about emotions, they're not positive or negative, they're destructive or constructive so that we can have destructive happiness, you know, grasping and wanting more. We can also have constructive anger. So something that might be uh, labeled as bad or undesirable uh, as an emotion could actually fuel a sense of finding a sense of justice in the world or letting our anger inform constructive action. So while you're, if you choose to practice this and you're with the right and the left hand, notice as what was just shared is there's kind of this neutrality between the two, which is a wonderful and very difficult invitation to bring that same neutrality to the emotions. And it, we're at times, so I, I can't really go too much further, but like this has been one of the biggest things that has influenced my life when I stopped, no, when I stopped labeling. Well, first, when I noticed that I was labeling my emotions as good or bad, but when I started realizing that they, um, that doesn't serve me very well, but uh, the kind of constructive, destructive. So keep practicing with those hands and you know, who knows what will happen with the emotions. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, thank you all for sharing. Thank you all for practicing. Let's uh, take a moment to dedicate. Um, also just wanna add a little bit with the full moon. So we'll, we'll just set some intention. So just for a moment, returning to closed eyes or lowering the gaze down. Taking a moment to reflect on this past hour and a half together. Practicing breath work or listening. Practicing mindfulness, listening to the teachings and the science behind emotional episodes, and then exploring and experimenting, being with both. So let's take a moment to set an intention. We're under a full moon, very auspicious time to set intention. So Maybe it's an intention for how you'd like to move forward into the next moment after this practice. Maybe it's an intention for this next lunar cycle. But just identifying an attitude or a way of being that you'd like to embody. Maybe to carry forward any attributes of wisdom or compassion that you touched into during our time together tonight. Maybe it's a statement or a single word. And let's dedicate the energy of this session together to those intentions, to our own, dedicating this energy to each other's intentions. May this dedication be an act of generosity towards all beings, May each of us realize our highest aspiration of realizing the enlightened mind, not just for the benefit of ourselves, but for all beings around us. May all beings be liberated from suffering. 
and may there be peace in this world. If it feels comfortable bowing to self, to others, to the enlightened mind inside all of us. And together, let's follow one last breath into the body. And then on the exhale, letting go, releasing this practice, this time together. Going back to open eyes if you've had them closed. So thank you all for joining both in person and on Zoom. I think we have kind of a global audience. I know we have some people from Australia and Mexico with us tonight. So I love that ripple effect of Dharma moving across the earth. Uh, I'm going to be uh, teaching a monthly mindfulness sitting here at the Dharma Collective. Um, the emphasis is gonna be on bringing mindfulness back into the Dharma. So in our culture, mindfulness is being pulled away. And so these sessions once a month um, on every, uh, the first Tuesday um, in the evening, we're gonna explore how mindfulness is interrelated to secular ethics, to compassion and loving kindness, why mindfulness is so important on the path to enlightenment. I'm also gonna be teaching a mandala meditation workshop. So as I mentioned before, I am an artist, um, particularly with mandalas. So I'll be doing that on September 18th. It's a Saturday workshop. Um, and Kate.